It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's also a great pleasure to talk right after Dr. Pan, because um, the reason I am here today as EMBO director is to celebrate uh, the uh, joining of India to EMBO as um, the first big uh, EMBO associate member state. And the negotiations over this started five years ago in Chennai when Dr. Ban was uh, still secretary and um, his optimism at the time together with Vijay's optimism really got us to the place where we are now. So I want to thank both of them and um, I also want to thank you all for being here and listening. What I will be talking about is um, I've, I've often, um, no, let's start with We're all here because we believe in the idea of excellence in science, um, that we want to make great discoveries, and we believe we can make them. And I want to talk a little bit about what it, what it takes to foster excellence, to break through science and high-risk, high-gain research. I've been asked to comment on this in the, in, in the past, and there are issues, of course, that I have been thinking about um, in my role as EMBO director. But I hope that you'll see that the conclusions that I've come to are, um, generally, are, are general. Breakthrough science is what we want. Um, and the concept of risk in doing the kinds of science that uh, uh, gets us to breakthroughs is related. Both of these issues are about the question of how to distribute resources to the right people in the right manner. And I'll talk about the connections between and about the flip side of risk, namely failure. EMBO does not directly fund science, but we're very good at selecting, so we don't give research grants, but we're very good at selecting the best people for a number of things. Um, an important question is, I'm not going to flip over to, uh, to your, I don't know, I'll continue, right? Um, so there's really a core question. How do you assess people um, and who assesses them? Our committee's good at allowing uh, the most original projects and the most original people to be elect, uh, uh, elected. I'll also um, give a voice, a voice of warning um, and, and point out that I think breakthrough science, high-risk science cannot uh, risk in isolation. We need a very solid basis of uh, secure science funding, not cheap but good science funding um, to, to enable top science, breakthrough science, high-risk science to happen. EMBO doesn't have uh, recipes or mechanisms, but we do have a number of young, highly selected scientists, and some of my uh, statements are based on their input. So let's try and think about why we think that risk is something good. I assume it's because it is recognized that we're hoping for something new and unexpected when we do research. So risk is implicit in doing something where we don't know the outcome. And we assume that the outcome will be something good. So that's why we, why we have this connection between high risk and high gain. That's obviously what everybody wants. So what's wrong with that? Well, nothing is wrong with that, um, except um, the why not is actually equally obvious. It's called risk because the high gain is not what happens every time. Some of the time, or in fact most of the time, depending on how high the risk was, the result is failure. So we somehow don't want that. We just want the high risk, high gain, and forget that if we want to see risky projects, we also have to be prepared to see failure. And for research funding organizations, what that means, if, you're, if you want high risk, you must be prepared to fund failure. Very counterintuitive, but it directly follows from what I've said. And failure is seen very differently in, in different countries. So in Europe, um, failure is seen as failure, period. Whereas, as, uh, for instance, Leszek Borisovic from Cambridge, but many others have also uh, stated this in similar terms, he says, what I see in the US is that failure is taking as gaining experience, and therefore encouraging you to start over and over again and again and again. Um, if we see failure only as negative, then we cannot expect anyone to conduct high-risk research. Why should anybody be so stupid to do that if they can go this uh, route and have an easy life? Of course, for scientists, risking and then succeeding in discovering something is really one of the most exhilarating experiences, and I believe that's really why we're all in it. 
that's what keeps most of us um, going and, and, and doing it. At least if I speak for myself, you know, you follow uh, something that you will think will work, even if nobody else thinks that, um, and then to see it succeed. But you have to ask yourself how many of us can really afford to do that today, especially of the younger people. Uh, we have to also be clear there are different kinds of failure. There is failure due to incompetence. That's not what we're talking about. The failure we're talking about here is where a scientist has an intelligent idea or hypothesis which they pursue uh, with well thought through, uh, well controlled and expertly formed experiments, but the hoped for insight does not materialize, which is not surprising, and no publishable results are obtained. And that is important. No publishable results are obtained. So there are results, of course. They're negative results. But nowadays, and when I say no publishable, um, what I and many mean is not publishable in a high impact uh, journal. And since in many places the high impact journals uh, are the only thing that determines success or failure. This means that in the end, um, there is no such thing as a good failure, namely fail, failing to support a hypothesis. Um, but it turns into a bad failure, even if you've done the experiments properly, namely a failed career. Um, so one has to wonder why anybody does bother to go into science to, if, if they're constantly um, assessed in these ways, and I'll return to assessment. But let me first give you a brief overview um, uh, from feedback that I've got from our EMBO communities about what it took them to succeed. And the communities I asked are, uh, are, are really most highly selected communities. One are the gold medal winners. So these are the youngest, these are young researchers um, in, in, in Europe who are awarded uh, for a fantastic discovery. So these are the ones who have succeeded. And the others are young investigators. And I really look forward to Indian young scientists becoming part of our Anglo young investigator uh, network. These are the ones who are selected just after setting having set up their labs, and they're selected on promise, on expected excellence. So we've got exactly those people uh, from whom we want the feedback. And of course, they're selected on past success, but they have not made their big breakthrough discovery yet. In the meantime, many of them have. So the people who were selected for these young investigator programs do go on to make fantastic discoveries. So um, I, I, gosh, that's highly legible. Um, I, I did get very good feedback. Um, very interesting feedback, and um, actually many participated and were enthusiastic in, in, in providing answers. So here is um, what they said. Um, can you read it? No, you can't. Wow. Okay, so in terms of funding, they did not ask for more money. They asked for stable money, where they weren't asked every five minutes, what did you do with it, write a report, uh, you know, how is your progress, have you published a paper after year one? Um, they want freedom. They want to make, have the ability to make ad hoc decisions. So if they've applied the grant for X, but it turns out in year one that X isn't working, do Y. I mean, do the next thing. That's what happens to scientists. We have good ideas all the time. Let them be allowed to follow them. Um, they want a good intellectual environment. They want colleagues who assess their work critically. They want to be challenged by critical questions from the, the colleagues that surround them. Um, and they want a good infrastructure that enables them to do the research they want. So I, I think this was really interesting. They want to do risky stuff. They're prepared to risk it. They don't need tons of money for it, but they need these conditions. And these are not the conditions that usually apply. So um, if we agree that we're willing to, if we were as a funder, um, uh, uh, prepared to fund risky research, then the obvious question is, how do we find the people who do it and how do I, we identify the projects? As we can't ask the applicants to say whether their project is risky, although some funders now ask to do that, especially the ERC in Europe. It's quite crazy. They ask the, the scientists to propose risky projects. Why can't we ask the scientists? Because like I said, we think we have a good idea. We don't think of it as risky because we're convinced that we're right. So, we can't. We can't ask the scientist. Um, it's not us who think it's risky, it's the others. What this means is that it's really the funders who have to take the risk. And that is one of the hardest parts. And I'm afraid we've, passed, uh, we've developed a bit of a pass the buck culture. Um, a delegation system in selecting uh, worthy projects. 
So scientists will come to funders, say, here's a great idea, give me money to do it. But the funders, of course, are very rarely individuals who make visionary decisions. Sometimes they are, Bill and Melinda Gates maybe. Instead, they delegate decisions, and they usually delegate it to committees. And since committees usually work by consensus, this is unlikely to favor risky, crazy ideas. Any crazy idea can easily be killed. Somebody in the committee just has to say, you know, where is the preliminary work? And how do you know it'll work? Well, I don't know it'll work. If I knew it would work, it would not be a risky project and would not be novel and original. Um, so the question is, why is this mechanism of selecting uh, unable to identify the most brilliant and original projects? Even if it's us, the scientists, who sit on these committees and who make the decisions at every point. I can think of a couple of reasons. One's already that I've already mentioned, and that's the need for consensus. It's very well possible that every scientist on the committee is great and brilliant, but we all have different ideas. So it's very unlikely that we all agree what's a, on the distinction between a risky and a crazy experiment. We're all trained to be super critical on the one hand and trust our own interests on the other. So how are you going to get a committee together to, to, to agree on a crazy uh, project? Um, that's one thing. And um, another point is that in the worst case, the committee simply delegates further. And they delegate further um, to the journals. What do I mean by that? In the worst case, the committee will simply use metrics, publication metrics, how many papers, what impact factor, how many citations. Now, you don't need humans with brains to do that, but you do need humans with brains to, to recognize interesting and original work. So um, these metrics, I think, are really pernicious. And EMBO has signed the uh, San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment, and we no longer um, uh, we no longer use metrics. And in fact, I think it is with us, the scientists and the funders, to get this right. And we've got to do something about this. There are a few good examples. Here's one from the Gulbenkian Institute in, in Portugal, and there are a number of other institutes that do that. They explicitly say uh, in, in their job adverts, they ask the candidates not to include any metrics, and they say they will not use metrics throughout. They will look at the people, they will look at the projects. And I think we have to return to that. I think metrics should be banned. Um, so let me give you an example that actually illustrates this very nicely. Um, this is the, um, I don't know, uh, Web of Science or so, uh, publication statistics for a German scientist by the name of Hegemann, which many of you may not have heard of. Um, he was a researcher at a minor university, a good but minor university in Germany, in Regensburg uh, until 2004. He sort of worked on algae, worked on channel rhodopsin, and didn't have any high impact uh, publications until 2011 when he published his first uh, ever paper in science. This was the description of the uh, 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 purification of channel rhodopsin from algae, which, as you may know, has now become the basis of, um, uh, of optogenetics. And, um, and you see what happened after he published this paper in 2000, massive, uh, uh, um, massive uh, citations and massive prizes. What's missing here is the Nobel Prize. I have no doubt he'll get it. What is the point I'm making here? He was a university professor with stable funding. Nobody cared about him. Had he applied for an ERC grant in 2011, he would not even have made it through the first round. However, his stable funding, his security, his job security allowed him to pursue this crazy idea and come up with a really transformative discovery. So what the point I'm making here is, is that what we really need is a good, strong basis from which to select, um, and that this, if this basis does not suffi offer sufficiently attractive conditions for those who end up failing in the race for glamour grants, then very few young people will be prepared to make to take the risk to embark on such a tough career in the first place. So that's actually the greatest risk nowadays, the risk to go into a scientific career at all. Um, so, and that, I want to now get back to my title. Um, I think we need this solid base with sufficiently long-term projects, but competitive projects. They have to be competitive. You have to be in a tough environment. Um, that allows scientists to um, 
the freedom to explore to uh, do the so-called Friday afternoon experiment. Now, the uh, chemists and physicists among you might know what the Friday afternoon experiment is. It's a term that was not invented by me, but by Andrew Geim. Uh, who got the uh, Nobel Prize uh, several years ago for that molecule that he's holding up there, um, carbon uh, 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 microfilms. And so what, what he did at some point, when he was a postdoc, uh, he was working in, in Utrecht, I believe, in, in, in the Netherlands at the time. One Friday afternoon, you know, he was getting bored, so he just went to the, to the electromagnet in, in the lab and cranked it up to absolute top max power. There was nobody else in the lab, so he just thought, I'll do this. And he took a glass of water and poured it down the middle. Utterly irresponsible, and he says now he has no idea what drove him to do that. But what happened was that the water actually levitated in the magnet, although we don't think of water as magnetic. So that allowed him to discover, make the discovery that non-magnetic uh, materials, in fact, in very high magnetic fields, uh, uh, attain magnetic uh, uh, properties. He also later floated a frog in that mat. And if you, if you Google this, um, uh, you'll see this levitating frog inside the magnet. So th that's what he did on a Friday afternoon. And when he had his own lab, he began to encourage his own students and postdocs to do the Friday afternoon experiment. In fact, he reserved Friday afternoons for his group to think about stuff that had nothing to do with their Monday to, you know, nine to five work, to do crazy things. They wouldn't go on doing, they would discuss them. They would try and play around. And if things uh, went and, you know, turned out not to be so much fun or not so crazy, then they would stop them. So there was discussion about it. But that's what they did. And actually, out of this, um, uh, he made several more discoveries. Oh, here's the frog. Um, he made several more discoveries. He discovered this gecko tape, which is based on, on, on the properties of gecko feet. Um, and he, he, he discovered the, the thin carbon films. So um, the point about this is that he was not funded to do any of this stuff. He had stable funding for, uh, you know, I won't say what he did was middle of the road work. He's clearly a, a, a truly brilliant scientist. But he had the freedom on the site to do crazy things without ever being asked, you know, what are you doing with our money, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's um, what we need to do in science. That's what we have to give our young people. And so in conclusion, um, I would say if we want to f fund transformative uh, breakthrough work, um, we have to um, not try to identify these particular individual breakthrough projects, but we have to um, fund securely, no red tape, no micromanagement, no constant control of our young scientists, um, but give them a secure environment to allow them to, to um, take risks. So fund well, fund long, no micromanagement, no uh, red tape, and trust in them once we've selected them. Thank you. <laughs>